invite you to remain standing for a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. And we are entering into, uh, into the early section of Matthew. It's a story that we don't get to share in worship very often. And maybe it's a little less awkward that way. <clears throat> because this is not a Sunday that we often get to celebrate. The first Sunday of Christmas often ends up being Epiphany or something else. But the way the calendar lands this year, we are, we are here. The first Sunday of Christmas tide. Matthew chapter 2. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. If you have a translation that you brought with you and it's a little different from mine, that is all right. Somewhere in between the words on your page and the words on mine, there is a word that God will speak to us together. A reading from Matthew. When the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I have called my son out of Egypt. When Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the word spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and much grieving. Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted, because they were no more. After King Herod died... An angel from the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who were trying to kill a child. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Friends, here with the Spirit is saying to God's people. You may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I grew up with the knowledge that December 28th was a special day. And it's not for any particularly churchy reason, um, although that, that might be the kind of thing that you expect from a preacher. But this isn't, this isn't actually a vocation that I had planned on pursuing early on. I was going to be an architect. My dad had drafted the plans for the house that I grew up in, in, in Maryville. I could totally do that. I like I like sitting at his drafting table and drawing up plans for carefully laid out houses, fitting pieces together like puzzle pieces, or for excitingly shaped skyscrapers. I kind of moved on beyond that, and later on, I wanted to be a singer. I'd be the next Barry Manilow. Or maybe the next Michael Ball. I'd star in Les Miserables or Phantom of the Opera. At no point until I was several years into adulthood did I contemplate being a pastor. I grew up with the knowledge that December 28th was a special day. Now you can look on your calendar, there's probably nothing there. It's just a blank. Christmas happens and then life stops until New Year's. But in our calendar at home, that date was marked. That was my father's birthday. 
So yesterday, my Uncle Alan and my Aunt Linda joined my sister Heidi and her trio of, of sons with my family in Maryville to celebrate Dad's 70th birthday. And Heidi made him the same applesauce cake that his grandmother would ship to him for his birthday in college. From New Jersey, by the way, to Maryville, Tennessee. I don't know how you ship a cake like that or how you expect it to stay okay. But that's how it, that's how it happened. But it was a good day, December 28th. Dad's... I was an adult when I learned that December 28th was also the fourth day of Christmas. Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and and a partridge and a pear tree. Look, y'all are good at this game. Excellent. Those 12 days count Christmas all the way up to January 5th, the eve of the Epiphany. Now, it wasn't until I started paying attention to the other feast days of the calendar that I realized that December 28th is also Holy Innocence. And not innocence with a C-E, like, like the characteristic of, of being without fault or being blameless. The word is innocent in the plural, innocent. And it's a direct reading, a direct reference to this reading that we share today that's appropriate to the first Sunday of Christmas tide, the exile of the Holy Family and the slaughter of the innocents. This is a dark, ugly story. In the, in the middle of the happy birthday, Jesus, light-heartedness light, light, light heartedness of, of, of Christmas tide is this nasty, nasty reminder of how power reacts to the threat of being overthrown. Now, there's part of me that hopes that Joseph doesn't catch wind of what happens in Bethlehem after he and Mary leave for Egypt with Jesus. And he knows he's escaping a powerful uh, an, a threat, and a, a potential threat to his whole family, definitely to his child. But does he know, does he have any idea how wide a net Herod is casting? Does he know how far Herod will go to protect his grip on that tenuous throne that Rome is letting him inhabit? Does he know those neighbors who are in that moment being visited by soldiers, their children ripped from mother's arms, their lives snuffed out before they learn to walk, before they learn to speak, before, before they learn to fear and hate those powers that threaten and oppress? What, what does his anguish look like if he knows their families, if he knows their histories, knows their names. Knows how desperately maybe they've prayed for, for this family, for this child. How heavy is his guilt when he realizes that that his confession is going to be like all those survivors of Job's catastrophes. You remember how that first chapter goes? The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby when the Sabians took them and killed the young men with swords. I alone escaped to tell you. A raging fire fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and devoured the young men. I alone escaped to tell you. Chaldeans set up three companies, raided the camels, and took them, killing the young men with swords. I alone escaped to tell you. Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house when a strong wind from the desert came and struck the four corners of the house. It fell upon the young people, and they died. I alone escaped to tell you. I alone escaped. When you can see the anguish and 
shock and the grief of stunning loss on the faces of friends and neighbors, escaping alone doesn't feel like divine blessing. It feels like the curse of guilt. On December 14, 2012, a young man showed up at Sandy Hook Elementary School and murdered 20 children Noah's age. He escaped because we're not from there. On June 12, 2016, 49 people were shot to death in an Orlando nightclub. I used to go to a club with my friends once a year to remind myself how much I was That's not my scene. On April 5th, 2018, Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials raided a meat packing plant in Bean Station, Tennessee, shattering families with no hope of reuniting. My family escaped because my immigrant forebears, not too many generations back, happened not to be from Central and South America. I'm, I'm reminded of the Reverend Martin Niemöller's remarks. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then, they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. We aren't, for the most part, in the position of the Holy Family today. We are generally in positions of safety and, and privilege. All around us are friends and family and neighbors, whether we know them or not, who are threatened by oppressive and racist and violent and bigoted, powerful people and groups. All around us are refugees. People fleeing dangerous situations, sometimes overseas, sometimes in their own homes. What are we doing in response? Are we turning a blind eye? Are we wringing our hands? Are we offering prayers to our feet? Or, or are we speaking out? And when we speak out, are we doing it with an audience that can actually make change happen? Or, or are we just complaining to folks who are willing to listen to us gripe? We aren't powerless. It's easy to tell ourselves that we are, but we have a voice. We have multiple ways to respond in ways that can actually affect change. In most of our pockets are communication devices through which we can organize, we can call elected and appointed officials, we can assign petitions, or we can do more creative advocacy work. And it's about doggone time we did. It's about time that we honored our refugee savior by rescuing the perishing. It's about time we modeled the love of who is particularly on the side of the powerless by sharing our own power. It is high time we stopped quenching the spirit who Joel says will pour out upon everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will also pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves. 
No one is excluded from the empowerment of God's Spirit. No one is excluded from the inclusive electrification of God's creation. We are all responsible for making sure everyone is in on overturning the status quo that the human race has been using to wreck ourselves and all creation since we first chose to try to gain the power of the Almighty. Since we took that, that first bites of the forbidden fruit that we had no capacity to digest. In the holy kinship that God is calling us back to, there is no place for any one of us to exclude any other one of us. In God's holy kinship, we are all siblings of every size and color and expression and beautiful variation in which God has created us. There is no them. There is only us. No more slaughter. No more genocide. No more racism. No more refugees. No more internment camps. No more borders. No more outsiders. No more segregation. No more slaughter of the innocents. Only love. Help me, y'all. Help me find the ways in which we can be loved to each other. We can do it! Together, we can end this violence and bring God's reign today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn today is a remembrance